Shakespeare had it partially correct when he penned the phrase, out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. Recently, the interest in near-death experiences has taken an exponential upswing. We want to know, does science give us hope of a heavenly future? Dr. Raymond Moody coined the term near-death experiences in 1976 in his book, Life After Life. Reported over the years were numerous cases involving the tunnel of light. Science shows us that brain stimulation can produce the sensation of leaving the body. My book explains how I, as a brain surgeon, came to the realization that there is survival of consciousness beyond the death of the physical body. You will read of my Hawaiian journey through the worlds of divine intervention, universal energy, and near-death experiences. It will be your introduction to the spiritual world. Many of you have heard about a near-death experience. So what really happens to the brain at the moment of death? Well, my guest today is Dr. John Turner. He's a neurosurgeon from Hawaii, and he's come all the way here today to talk about near-death experiences. And I'm really excited to have you here on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Kristen, with you. So now your background is as a neurosurgeon. You've worked with a lot of patients. Tell me a little bit about what you have seen and witnessed yourself inside your own practice. I've analyzed this carefully because, first of all, I was an engineer and a physicist. And then I went to neurosurgery, and then I was in neurosurgical practice on the big island of Hawaii, the only neurosurgeon there. So I work with death and dying a lot. I also work with forms of energy healing, such as you have done Reiki yourself. But I've really been interested in what happens at the moment of death, and then what happens to those who we call near-death survivors. And there's a lot of recent interest in this. Just in the last month or so, this article, a Newsweek article about proof of heaven, has made people realize, well, wait a minute. When we die, maybe it's not just lights off. So what I like to talk about is what does happen at the moment of death and what happens after death of the physical body? You know, I think that this is such an interesting topic, Dr. Turner, because there are so many of us who have loved ones who they pass on. And we always wonder, you know, what, what happens to that person, that, that husband, that wife, that child, um, when they go on to heaven, so to speak? It's important to know that, mm -hmm. and everyone wants to know. And the question is, is it a matter of faith? Is it a matter of science? Or can the two be blended somehow to teach us what happens? And I feel the near-death survivors, such as those in a coma that may have died but didn't, those who actually were near death, where they have flat brain wave, we have an excellent case of that with mm -hmm. Pam Reynolds. Right. And that's taught us that, yes, here is a woman who was near death. She had no blood flow to her brain. It was stopped for surgery. And in fact, the bed of the table was tilted to drain all the blood from her head so they could open up and fix an aneurysm vessel. Well, what happened, she was also connected to the brain wave monitor. So we know she had a flat line. She also had in her ears plugs that produce 100 decibel clicks. Now, that's a loud sound. If you have that in your ear, you really can't hear a conversation. But she reported conversations during the time when she was supposedly dead. So it's a very important case. So there are many things now that have led me to conclude that there's no question about it. Consciousness is not produced by the brain. It survives death of the physical body. You know, it's interesting because we have seen these case studies like you talked about where someone has had a near-death experience, and they say that it changed the way they wanted to live their life. There was a book, by, a famous book by Dr. Kenneth Ring. It came out in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. It's called Heading Towards Omega. Omega is the last of the alphabet, and it means the end. Mm -hmm. But what happens to our consciousness? What goes on? And that's what people want to know. Like you said, when they lose a loved one or even an animal, what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment of death, something very interesting happens. There's a clarity that comes. And I saw this in the case of my mother. I was right there at her bedside. And after laying in a coma, not a coma, but a deep sleep for three weeks, she suddenly opened her eyes and she looked right at me. No expression on her face. And I took that moment to get close to her, if I may come a little closer. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, Mom, I want to thank you for everything you've done for us. I said, because of you, Mom, we're going to be just fine. So you can go now. You don't have to worry. Well, what happened? She closed her eyes, turned her head, and was back in this deep sleep. 
Well, I set my clock for two hours, because every two hours I would turn her. And I had this dream, Chris, and in the dream, I'm at the hospital having a white coat, and the nurse says, Dr. Turner, please, can you look at your mother? And I turn around, and there is a row of beds, and there she is in the bed. Mm -hmm. And I took out my pen, and on the bed sheet I wrote, no oral intake for three weeks, family does not wish to push fluids. And as soon as I signed my name, it was like an order sheet, I woke up. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I went in, and, and that was that. Right. I was telling this story at a conference, international conference on after-death communication. And a woman came up to me, and she said, Dr. Turner, I thought you'd like to have this picture that I took when you explained how your mother died. And in the picture over my head is this large orb, big thing. Ooh, you're giving me the chills. Yeah. <laughs> and now people who say, well, that's just a matter of dust and moisture. Mm -hmm. It's funny that it would show up at a conference on after-death communication. When you're talking yeah, about talking, your mother. <laughs> yeah. So there's this period at the moment of death where people become lucid. Now, John Lerma is a hospice doctor, a friend mm -hmm. of mine, who did studies where he put these people who were dying at that moment into an MRI scanner, mm -hmm. a functional MRI that showed areas of the brain were lighting up that he felt couldn't possibly light up at death, right? Right. So at the moment of death, this happens. But the more important thing, Christian, is what happens to these people after they've come back. They're usually given a choice. Do they want to continue on? And I think all your listeners know about the different stages. There's being out of the body, looking down at the body. There's this tunnel opening up and so forth. All these things, but they involve one important thing. They involve a being in the light. And these people somehow meld and blend with that light. Mm -hmm. And when they come back, they feel they brought part of that light back with them. And more amazing, people like me who study this, by an empathetic connection, I'm starting to pick up that light too, just like I had experienced what they've gone through. You know, I have heard before that there is a such thing as a life review. What, did, what does that mean to have a life review? You, you know, you go to the other side, you connect with the light like you're talking about. Is it a movie that people see? I mean, what are some of the stories or reports that you... Most of all the reports are similar. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them say that in black and white, there's a three-dimensional presentation of their entire life, and it's fast, but it contains everything that happened. Mm -hmm. It's not to judge, but they feel what's happening. For example, let's say there's a scene where they put someone through something very terrible. They really hurt them. They feel that pain. Mm -hmm. So they get a chance to see this life review. Now, that's fine, but the key thing about this is in Dr. Moody's new book, Glimpses of Eternity, came out uh, last year. In that book, people are there at the bedside. They don't have dying brains, but they have seen that life review that the patient goes through. They've heard the same heavenly music. They've seen this portal opening in the ceiling with the beckoning of the loved ones, and there's nothing wrong with their brains. And I would say the cases he collected quietly over the years kind of show that, look, there has to be these things that go on. There's no doubt about it. So that's one of the three things that, to me, prove that there is survival of consciousness. So you said there's three things. What are the other two things? The other is the work of Dr. Michael Newton in mm -hmm. his two books, Journey of Souls. And in there, he regressed people hypnotically back to a past life. But mm -hmm. that wasn't the key thing. He then focused on that time between lives. Mm -hmm. And they all said this, that we have some type of guardian spirit, or mm -hmm. maybe more, and that the spirit sometimes may decide to come down and take this trip with us. And that we're able to plan in this realm, the spiritual world, our next reincarnation. And I have a son now who's seven years old. But when he was about four, one day, I'm sitting, he's sitting like this looking at TV, and I'm looking at him, and suddenly he's just staring at me with a smile like this. His name is Doshi, which means one who intends to follow the right path. And I mm -hmm. said, Doshi, hold that thought. What are you thinking? He said that I am you and you are me. Mm. Now look, he was three or four years old. So a year went by, and I have a good friend in Phoenix, but I told him that story, and you know what he said to me? He said, I've got the feeling, strong feeling, that this boy came to be your protector. I said, my protector, what do you mean? He said, just trust me on that. So that night, a year later, I said, Doshi, if you're going to protect me, why? You know what he said? Hmm. He said, because I am you and you are me. Wow. Then later, when I study all this, <laughs> and this in-between live study of Dr. Newton, I realize this boy did decide to come down and be a guardian angel along with me in the flesh. And he does protect me. Right. 
Because now, if women come up to me, they used to say, oh, Dr. Turner. <laughs> now they see him, and they say, oh, what a cute little boy. Right. It's like he deflects it. <laughs> so anyway, that's the second thing. Yeah. The third thing is the case of Pam Reynolds, a near-death case that proves that she had no brain activity. It's a classic case, and it's one of the best we have. So, Dr. Turner, I know that you have written a book, Medicine, Miracles, and Manifestation. And we have had a discussion about how important it is for people to not only connect with this light, but what that really means is to have a compassion or an understanding for everyone else who shares this world that we live in. I think it means that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. There's a connectivity to this whole thing with the consciousness and the clarity of consciousness. Once people realize that we're all brothers and sisters, that we're all one, and we can't discriminate against anything or anybody, the world can change. We have a chance to wake up. I think that's the thing. We came from light. All of the cells of our body, except perhaps maybe hydrogen, comes from a supernova explosion somewhere. Hmm. And as Neil deGrief Tyson uh, of the Hayden Planetarium said, look, we're all made of light. Let's just celebrate the fact and not try to analyze it. And that may be the best bet, because we're all the same. We're all one. So as a scientist, you are saying that there is scientific evidence that we are in fact constructed of light? Oh, there's no question. Like I said, all, everything, this book, you and me, everything here came as a result of a supernova explosion somewhere in this universe. That's just a fact. There's no doubting about it. So we're composed of light. People who approach death go into that light. They become one. But that light is an all-loving light, the way they describe it. It's pure love and they come back changed. They come back understanding the power of love, which makes everything work. It's all based on love. So if we are made of light, and then we have a near-death experience, it sounds almost like you're saying that we return to light. Well, we return to the source. Mm -hmm. And somehow that source in the near-death experiences has been a presence in that light, some type of a presence. Mm -hmm. But it's been so powerful that they don't want to leave. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But things that make them come back are obligations like family, these things. But if they had a choice, they would stay with this love. That unfinished business. Well, <laughs> unfinished business, I, if you mention that, I just have to say uh, that a gentleman who I kind of know, uh, Van Prog is his name, James yes. Van Prog, wrote the book, Unfinished Business, which was a monumental book. We really can't leave here with unfinished business. We have to learn forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing I was able to learn along this pathway. That's interesting. Forgiveness. That part mm. of having finished or unfinished business is our ability or inability to forgive. Well, I think once we get rid of that ego, yeah. and one thing that helped me was the Course in Miracles designed to get rid of that ego. Once we can get rid of that, we can move on. And once we can get to that point of total forgiveness of mm -hmm. those we need to give forgiveness, then all kind of doors open up. So as a neurosurgeon, Dr. Turner, what would you say forgiveness looks like? I can't say what it looks like. I can tell you what it feels like. Okay. I remember the day that I finally gave the last person forgiveness that I needed to forgive. Years ago, I contacted everyone I thought I may have hurt and asked for forgiveness. Most of the time, they didn't remember what I was talking about. And I told them, you know, the thing is, I remember, and I need to ask for your forgiveness. And they did. But what I hadn't done was to forgive those people who put me through some rough times. Mm -hmm. When I learned that we reincarnate in soul families, so to speak, and perhaps our connection you mentioned earlier, what is it? We're all part of that same soul family, right. it appears, right? Once I realized that these people volunteered to teach me forgiveness, and once I saw that and I forgave them, I realized I have to love them for that because mm -hmm. they allowed me to learn forgiveness. It's important. You have to go through some tough times. You have to go through the fire, so to speak. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting. I think that when we talk about forgiveness, we always think about, okay, who do I need to ask forgiveness from? But oftentimes, I do believe that we forget to forgive ourselves as well. Yeah, we got to do that. That's <laughs> very important, too. But, but yeah. it's all hooked together. Everything happens here for a reason, and it's all perfect. There are no mistakes. So, Dr. Turner, what would you like to see happen? I mean, you're 70 years old. You're a practicing physician in Hawaii. You've 
seen incredible things. What's your vision for where you would like to see the world move next? It turns out that because of my studies and my experiences, and I mentioned recently with John of God in Brazil, I had to realize there is such a thing as a Holy Spirit. And from a patient of mine who wrote books on this, he describes it as an interdimensional being that wants us to heal and makes his presence known to what we call miracles. I came to that realization, and now I realize that death comes first, then this concept of some God comes, and then the light. It's all connected in one way. And there actually is no such thing as death. It's just a moment of changing trains, so to speak, because we continue on forever and ever. I like that, changing trains. It's kind of like that. Yeah. There's a hmm. waiting time where we can do some planning. Yeah. And we, not, we may not remember all of this. You know, unless we're at the we're, station. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that's what's happening now. But right. It's hard to say. If I can continue on a moment with that thought, uh, I do consultations now for people in auto accidents, for example. My first patient told me about a terrible accident because I asked him, I said, why do you have the steel pin in your leg that now they think a screw is loose and they sent you to me? He said, well, it happened two years ago in Las Vegas. He said, I was on the job, nice afternoon, I got in the back of the car to go to sleep, two guys were driving, and he said, I woke up, it was pitch black, and the car was rolling, rolling. It slammed into a brick wall. He said, I looked down, and the bone was jutting out of my leg. Wow. The blood was spurting. I said, what the? He said, my foot was on fire. I said, what did you do, man? He said, somehow I kicked out the back window. I got out. I got to the driver's door. When I opened it, I pulled him out, and his legs were blazing on fire, and the passenger was sitting there on fire. I said, man, then what? He said, I don't know. He said, I know they operated. I remember the big lights and all that. He said, but I don't remember a lot. I said, well, what about this? Here you look around, just like you and I are in the studio. I said, look around this office. It looks clean and modern, right? Mm -hmm. Computer there, screen here, the x-rays. I said, get this. Is it possible that you and I are both dead and we don't know it? <laughs> you know what he That's said? He said, wow, you're the second person to ask me that. He said, I really don't know. Mm. I said, well, listen, brother, you would enjoy the movie Passengers because <laughs> it explores just that. And maybe, you know, I've had, I was in an accident where I don't recall about half hour of the whole thing. Maybe we're at this way station right now, Christian. Right. But the point is, we've got to realize whatever it is, the important thing is not, is this real? Is this a dream? The important thing is, what are we learning? Right. Because we do get to take that with us. The studies show that our memory does go along with us to that next incarnation. You know, it's interesting. I've heard it called before the Earth School. Mm -hmm. that we're here in this lifetime on this planet to learn from our experience. Is that what you mean, the Earth School? We're here to learn our lessons, like a university? Or well, is it really more of a kindergarten? <laughs> well, since it goes on forever and ever, all I can say this, I think it's a matter of polishing our spiritual bodies. Right. And it may take repeat times here or someplace like this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. For me, this has been a school of hard knocks. It's to learn forgiveness, mainly. And uh, that's what I finally learned. Right. And now if I would have to move on tomorrow, I'd be comfortable knowing that the next stage is going to be even better. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your book, uh, Medicine, Miracles, and Manifestations. And, and I love this subtitle, A Doctor's Journey Through the Worlds of Divine Intervention, Near-Death Experiences, and Universal Energy. So what prompted you to write this book? Uh, one day, sitting at the computer, I had a computerized version of the I Ching. Some people might pronounce that the I Ching, but it's ancient Chinese fortune telling. Thing. So I typed in the first question. I said, am I on the right path? And what came out of that was very amazing. It told me that I should really start thinking about what was happening because there was some quote unquote enormous potential involved. And I see now it was for me to tell some stories and the story of how I came to the realization that life is like a series of reincarnations, that's like the cover, this, this dandelion. Of course, we don't have these in Hawaii. And on the mainland, when my friend first saw this cover, he called me back to say, I thought about this deeply. He said, when I saw this again, I wondered what kind of person would keep a dandelion in a pot like that. And then he realized that there was a water pot behind it. Now, I thought it was a teapot when I first saw this cover. 
But he said, I wonder who would be taking such good I'm care have it of up that. For you. Yeah, so I called the guy who did this picture, and he said, that's exactly what it was a water pot, and the color represents the purity of medicine. Well, the dandelion represents a never ending story. You know, each one of these seeds will grow again, and it's just a never ending story. So that's what, why I wrote the book, was so on, someone might read this and say, well, look, there's something in this for me. There's a teaching point. And I felt that if one person was helped, it was worth all the effort. So in your time as a neurosurgeon in hospitals, watching people go through death experiences and near-death experiences, what have you learned about what happens at the moment of death? I've learned that as doctors, and particularly neurosurgeons, there are times when we can bring someone back from that death. But when we can't, we've got to realize that it was supposed to be that way. There may mm -hmm. be many karmic reasons that I could never understand why this person can't be saved. But we've got to do the best we can do it. That's why we keep trying. But we've got to learn sometimes when to let someone go. And that's very difficult, especially in the case with the child, as you've seen in that first chapter of the book. That's very difficult. But that's the reason I wrote the book. I said, if it benefits at least one person, then I'll be happy. So, Dr. Turner, we have talked a little bit about empathy and how there may be perhaps an empathy deficit here in the world. Can you explain that? I'm just, we're just quoting President Obama on that because he said, we've got to learn to stand in the other person's shoes. We've got to erase this empathy deficit. Empathy is the ability to feel the other person's pain. Once we can do that, we're always going to be willing to extend a helping hand because mm -hmm. we're all going through this together. And my associates in Austria, in Australia have now received funding for the film, Stand in My Shoes, and it's going to talk about this. It's a, a population field, a patient field film. Everyone can participate in this. Patients, uh, anyone can. And we're going to, they're going to film all over the world but also with the neurologist at Stanford, Dr. Mobley, they're going to work on a way to maybe, how can we stimulate the brain to energize that area? Because there is an area in the brain, I'm sorry. There is an area in the brain that's responsible for empathy. And if that can be stimulated somehow by audio signals, electromagnetic pulses, then we might be able to save those years that it takes in meditation to understand empathy, we may not have to go through this kundalini awakening process mm -hmm. to understand empathy. We may not have to nearly die to understand this empathy, love, and the light. So that's the reason I wrote the book. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner. And I, I agree with you that empathy is very much a key to unlocking that gateway to compassion. So I just want to thank you so much for being here with us on The Ripple Effect. And thank you for your drop of wisdom today. Well, you're welcome. And I should be thanking you for this privilege. Thank you. Shakespeare had it partially correct when he penned the phrase, out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. Recently, the interest in near-death experiences has taken an exponential upswing. We want to know, does science give us hope of a heavenly future? Dr. Raymond Moody coined the term near-death experiences in 1976 in his book, Life After Life. Reported over the years were numerous cases involving the tunnel of light. Science shows us that brain stimulation can produce the sensation of leaving the body. My book explains how I, as a brain surgeon, came to the realization that there is survival of consciousness beyond the death of the physical body. You will read of my Hawaiian journey through the worlds of divine intervention, universal energy, and near-death experiences. It will be your introduction to the spiritual world.